All right, welcome everyone to Boston Singers Resource Choir's Comeback panel. We have a vibrant panel and an exciting group of uh, attendees tonight. And we're excited to have a conversation about all of the different elements that are going into getting ourselves back into choral singing starting in the fall. We'll start with a presentation from James Liu, also a member of our board of directors, who is a physician and a choral singer himself, who will talk about some of the tools that he's found and the resources he's found to aid in planning. And then we'll hear from Meyer Chambers, Lisa Graham, and Mark Mummer, who are all involved in all different kinds of vocal programs who will share um, some of the considerations they've had as they've made decisions throughout the last couple months and getting ready for September. So this should be a nice time of idea sharing, resource sharing. I do want to reiterate, we had this on our website, but I, all, I just want to make sure that everyone is clear that um, this is not a substitute for medical advice. This is not meant to be medical advice, and this is just for educational purposes. And BSR and its staff and panelists cannot be held liable for any Thing that results from decisions that you make based on what you hear tonight. So we do have to give you that disclaimer. Um, so thank you all for your attentiveness to that. Many of you submitted questions before the uh, panel and those questions were provided to the panel and answers to many of them will be likely be worked into some of the um, things that they say. I know James um, spent a lot of time thinking about those and preparing some answers. But once we've heard from everyone, there will be time for more Q&A um, and we'll invite you to offer your questions. You can offer questions in the chat as we go. I'll be moderating the chat. So if I see something in there, I will um, bring that up at a break in the conversation. So once again, on behalf of Boston Singers Resource, welcome to our Choirs Comeback panel. And I will turn things over to James to get us started. Thank you. Uh, let me get my, so I have created a uh, PowerPoint slide deck because no doctor is ever complete without a PowerPoint slide deck. Um, and I, I built this uh, in response to, I mean, I, I looked over the, the, there were a whole batch of really, really good questions that were asked. Um, and it's not that I'm gonna answer them one by one. I tried to sort of build this around the recurring themes that sort of came with the, uh, with the questions. Um, in terms of my background, uh, I'm a primary care physician doing internal medicine at MIT Medical. Um, in addition to that, I'm a classically trained baritone doing opera, oratorio, and art song. I sing with cantata singers. I sang for nine years with the Choir First Church in Boston, and I'm now sort of platooning between there and King's Chapel. Um, and I'm going to be in a performance of the Magic Flute in about two or three weeks. Um, I am also a board member, and uh, included on here is my website. Uh, I've got my own disclaimers. I have no financial relationships to any of the companies that might be mentioned here. I will not be mentioning any particular masks by name, for instance. Um, my opinions do not reflect those of MIT, not necessarily those of Boston Singers Resource or any of the groups that I sing with. Um, it is important to know that the science behind this is in constant evolution. So what I have here is already out of date. For 6.40 p.m. Uh, and while I do more than play a doctor on TV, it is uh, important to once again emphasize this is not to be counted as professional medical advice. Um, so take the information, but please do consult with other sources when making your decisions. Okay, so. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about COVID itself. I don't think it needs that much of an introduction. The two big things that I think are on a lot of people's minds, one of them is something that happened at the very start of the pandemic, which is that at the time that people were trying to decide do we shut down or not, um, a community chorus in the Skagit Valley in Washington decided to go ahead with a rehearsal on a fateful night in March of 2020. A single member of the choir showed up sick and decided to show up to the to the uh, rehearsal anyway. Um, some 
two thirds of the group immediately got sick afterwards. A total of 87% wound up getting sick and a couple of people died as a result of exposure to COVID-19. Uh, this was the thing that basically shut down all singing uh, in addition to a couple of other events. There was also, a, uh, I think, a St. Matthew Passion in Amsterdam that had a similar kind of effect on both performers and audience alike. Um, the other thing that's clearly on many people's minds is that this is a virus that survives because it mutates and the mutations that have increased infectivity, uh, possibly increased uh, virulence have survival advantages. And the most recent variant that has come out is the Delta variant, which is rapidly becoming the dominant type that is in the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, but it's constantly varying the Lambda variant or the Mu variant or the Omicron variant or the Omega variant could very well be the next big horror. So one of the things I want to do, uh, I, I'm not going to give you a guaranteed method. I'm not going to give you rules. I'm going to give you how you figure out how worried to be and what you can do about mitigating the risk that you've got. So there are a couple of different places where you can see roughly how active COVID is. Now, this is there are things that can throw off this stuff, like if they're not testing, you may not have an accurate description of what's going on. Massachusetts, I think, is actually pretty good about being fairly aggressive and widespread with their testing. Um, there are a number of sites that will show you what Massachusetts rates are like. This is from a site called 91dvoc.com. You'll notice that that is COVID-19 spelled backwards. Um, and this will break it down for you by country, by state. Uh, it'll show you, uh, this is the, the new confirmed cases per week. Uh, it'll also show you total cases, death rates, whatever you'd like to plot. Um, there's another sort of interesting thing to look at, which is that it turns out that the SARS-CoV-2 is excreted in stool. Um, and while there is not much data that suggests that it is contagious through contaminated food or fomites or anything like that, you can actually do sampling of COVID activity in poop. Um, and it's, it's been interesting that the rate at which the poop numbers start to heat up anticipate what happens in terms of these positive rates by a good two or three days. Um, the MWRA, which handles the sewage for the greater Boston area, has been doing poop sampling since May. And on their website, this, it's this link down here on the bottom, uh, they regularly update this thing that shows you what the poop numbers look like. You can actually pull up a spreadsheet that shows what the titers look like. Um, the the all-time low was about a month ago. Uh, with reopening, the numbers have gone up a little bit, although thankfully it has not looked like this, which is what we are worried about. And the issue here is that if those numbers start taking off, you do have to be prepared to rethink your strategy. Um, in terms of using the prevalence numbers to help you to figure out what the risk is, uh, there are two sites that might be helpful. This is a site that was built by a group at Georgia Tech University. Um, I don't think I'm actually going to go through pulling this up because switching screens is going to be a little bit too complicated, but the link is right here and, and the slide deck will be uh, sent out as a link also. Um, this thing allows you to drill down in the United States and find the, if, if you have an event in any given county of the United States, uh, with this thing here, with this slider, you can indicate how large your gathering is. Um, and it will give you a rough estimate of what is the chance that somebody in this, in this county has COVID. So if you have a gathering of 50, the risk is such and such. If the gathering is 200, the risk is substantially higher. If you have 10, the risk is negligible. Um, and, and that's the key thing if you start looking at importance here. Uh, this is another site, the, the link for that is down here on the bottom, which is, 
and by the way, this was this site was built before vaccines, um, before masks and social distancing. So it's not taking into account anything about immunizations or anything. It is purely based on what's the rate at which we're actually picking up disease in that given county. Um, on the right, this is a site that allows you to um, take various different situations. Uh, the rooms can be things like an auditorium, a school, a church, uh, what kinds of behavior you're doing. Singing is actually one of the options without masks or with masks. Uh, how old the people are that are involved in the process and what kind of virus is the dominant thing. It actually has calculations for the alpha variant, the beta variant, the gamma variant, the delta variant. Uh, if there is somebody in the room who has COVID, it will tell you how long you can can actually have people in that space safely. James? So, yes. We had a question in the chat. Um, okay. Having spent some time with the event risk assessment planning tool, um, Martha is wondering if there are churches that have participants from multiple counties. Do you have any advice on how to use that tool um, to think about risk assessment? Uh, it's a good question. It, there's not a good answer. Um, if you know what county everybody comes from, I suppose you can try pulling up the risk in each specific county. Um, if you futz around with the counties around Massachusetts, the rate doesn't vary that much from county to county. I think the bigger issue is if they're coming from a different state. Um, in particular, if they're coming from a state that is not, uh, uh, that is not so good at testing, <laughs> controlling, et, et cetera. Um, but but if you look at, say, Suffolk County versus Middlesex County versus Essex County, the, the numbers are actually pretty similar uh, from county to county. Thank you. And thank you, Martha, for your question. Um, why is sing particularly a problem? Well, it took some doing for us to eventually figure out that the virus can be carried in a mix of different kinds of particles. So with everything that we do with our breathing system, we, we eject water vapor of, in particles of various different sizes uh, from 0.1 micrometers up to 10,000 micrometers. Um, the smaller particles are called aerosols. The larger particles are called droplets. Um, the smaller particles are generated by uh, the orange thing here, for instance, is just the regular stuff that happens with the act of breathing. But if you do more breathing, if you do have your panting, you're going to generate more particles. Uh, this blue curve here is the, is the spectrum of particles that are generated through the flapping of the vocal folds back and forth. Um, so it's a bigger range and it's a bigger range of sizes of particles. Uh, the oral, which is the purple curve here, is the droplets. Th those are the ones that are generated through spit in the mouth, on the tongue, things like that. Um, there was initially sort of a thought that it was entirely transmitted through droplets. The, the issues with droplets being that they're heavy enough that they will actually fall to the ground within a distance of about six feet. That's where the number comes from for uh, social distancing of six feet, knowing that that's an approximation. Uh, as you can see, all these things are bell-shaped curves. There are no hard cutoffs with any of them. Uh, but there has since been pretty decent data that suggest, suggests that both aerosols and droplets can transmit the virus. So this link here uh, has uh, a, a science brief that will be updated periodically from the Centers for Disease Control that has, if you want to dig into the weeds about what we know about what is associated with transmission, this actually has a nice little summary of what we know. Um, I think if there's any one big takeaway point, the big takeaway point is that the principal risk factor is extended indoor exposure in underventilated spaces. Um, the, the risk is lower if you're outdoors, the risk is lower if the air circulates, but we'll, we'll get more into that in a moment. So the, the CDC science brief section is sort of a very useful resource. The second one is the second link here, which uh, there's a big study that is being done uh, by collaborators from Colorado State University and from the University of Maryland who are looking at um, what, 
what activities in terms of music making generate aerosols, generate droplets, and what can you do to mitigate it? Now, they are what they are not doing, they are not doing a study to see does doing this transmit COVID because nobody wants to impose that study on anybody else. Uh, but they've gotten some valuable data about what are the things that generate aerosols, how much, uh, and the answers are not always necessarily what you might think. Um, the third link is to another science brief from the CDC, which talks specifically about transmission in schools, uh, which might be relevant in terms of the risks that children in particular are, um, are uh, exposed to. Um, one of the big things out of the Colorado State study is that how much you actually produce in terms of particles uh, basically correlates with the volume of air that gets moved. So men in general tend to generate more particles than women. Uh, adults generally tend to generate more particles than, uh, than children. Um, singing and shouting tends to generate more particles than speaking or whispering or humming. Uh, again, knowing none of these are hard cutoffs, it's just sort of general distributions of where things go. So what can we do to try to help control the risk? So the first link is a nifty thing that has all the different data that we have about how the vaccines against COVID-19 help to lower the risk of getting COVID-19. The data from this is extremely encouraging. So far, multiple studies, both before these things got approval and following people in multiple different countries after approval have shown that pretty much all the major vaccines available in the Western world have protection rates from disease anywhere between 64% and 99%, although we believe it takes at least two weeks after your final immunization in order for you to be considered fully immunized because it does take time for the body to ramp up the antibody production and give you the protection. Uh, the rates at which these vaccines reduce the risk of hospitalization or death have been described as as high as 100%. We now know that's no longer true, uh, but it seems to offer even stronger protection against serious illness. So it could produce minor illness, but should produ produce protection against serious illness. Uh, we have also very good long-term follow-up data that's showing that these immunizations are safe. Yes, there are complications that have been described. There's the blood clot thing. There's the myocardial thing, but these things occur at exceedingly low rates. And when you compare the risk of these complications versus what happens if you get COVID-19, it's a very easy decision about which one's the better risk to take. Um, the consideration at this point is that for the moment in the United States, these are only approved under what's called an emergency use authorization. Um, and so far, only Pfizer has been, um, the Pfizer's vaccine has been approved for uh, children down to the age of 12. For my 11-year-old twin daughters, this is a non-trivial consideration. Um, they will be, uh, uh, Pfizer is applying for uh, approval for their vaccine for the ages of five and up this fall. And the FDA is also looking at the vaccines for full formal approval. So that will be changing uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, uh, there are multiple questions and concerns about uh, Delta is, is possibly up to three times as contagious as the standard uh, viruses. Uh, although this, uh, the, the, this, the, the second link here is actually hot off the presses published in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday. Um, it's a study from Great Britain that is suggesting that the mRNA vaccines such as the Pfizer vaccine could reduce the risk of serious illness, hospitalization or death from the Delta variant still by as, as much as 96%. Uh, the rates of protection are actually with one shot, it is not adequate, but with two shots, it's comparable to the protection rate from other variants of COVID-19. Um, one concern that some groups have raised is about the question of requiring immunization in order for groups to gather. Um, in particular, what happens if you require immunizations where the people that are involved are members of a union um, where the union has some concern sometimes around um, uh, mandating an immunization that's only been approved under an emergency use authorization. Um, this link that I have here is from the uh, 
from the federal government, which talks about how the um, the 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 federal the, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, is what it what it implies as far as requiring immunizations are concerned. Um, with the upshot, it, it's worth looking through. But the big take home point is that when you're talking about a disease that has such a potentially devastating impact on the other people in the room, it is in fact legal as long as you have the ability to have medical and religious exemptions to mandate immunization for people who are participating in a chorus. Um, I've been talking a little bit with some, or I've, uh, I've been hearing sort of indirectly from some people with uh, union ties among orchestra players, and it's looking like a lot of the unions will be requiring immunizations, at least in the Boston area as well. Uh, questions do remain about uh, mandating it is all well and good. How do you actually go about enforcing, verifying that people in fact did get the immunizations? Uh, there is also the fair question that was asked about what to do with audience members. I think it's much harder to mandate immunization in the audience, uh, although you can certainly at least strongly recommend it. Uh, one, one suggestion that's been made by a lot of groups is that they, there's someone who's keeping track of whether they've been completely immunized or not. Uh, they will need some sort of a proof, such as an immunization card, but once they get it, they don't keep it. They just keep a yes, no thing in a checklist. I, I do think it's probably not a good idea to retain confidential information because the immunization cards have um, identifying information such as birth dates. So, so you do want to think about being able to get it securely, uh, record the information accurately, but not keep it. Uh, but I think it, I, I would be very hard put to say that, uh, that you would not want to use immunization as one of the tools to help lower the risk. Um, the second big thing is the question of airflow. Um, there, is, uh, there are multiple studies that suggest that if you do your activities outdoors, the risk is lower than indoors. The risk is not zero if it's outdoors, but it is substantially lower. Uh, things that cause more air to move past the people, such as open doors or windows, such as uh, state-of-the-art uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, uh, things that are moving more air, creating more exchanges of all the air in the room will clear particles faster. Uh, there are things such as HEPA filters that can help to also clear aerosols. You need to figure out uh, how much filtration you need. And there is a downside in that the more filtration, the more air exchange, the more noise you have, and the more noise you have, sometimes that makes it difficult to actually be able to sing and be heard. Um, this link that I have here is to a PDF document that was developed by the National Association of Teachers of Singing, which has a nifty uh, uh, guide to the things to think about in terms of mitigation strategies and a batch of links if you want to find out more about HEPA filters and air exchanges and things like that. Um, another thing that's come out of the Colorado study is that because it's the volume of air that seems to correlate the best with how many particles get generated, um, it turns out that if you're actually monitoring carbon dioxide levels in the room, that actually seems to correlate surprisingly well with how much air is being moved. And there are carbon dioxide monitors that you can get and keep in rehearsal spaces that might help to give you a sense of are things getting to a more dangerous level. And, and that Nats thing has a link for uh, what you would do in terms of how you would actually try to do that. There are a couple of strategies in terms of trying to help limit the risk of exposure. Um, the, most the most drastic of which some groups have already done, which is to get all your performers together. You quarantine as a group. So you stay in one place for 10 or 14 days with no contact with anybody else, because if you, if you have COVID, it's going to show up within 10 or 14 days. Um, you do all your rehearsing in an enclosed space with no other people involved. You do your performing in an enclosed space, and then and only then can you leave. This is not a practical strategy for most people, um, but it, it has been done. It actually has been done successfully. Uh, the National Basketball Association last year actually did a remarkably impressive job of maintaining a so-called performance bubble where all the teams that were playing stayed in one common space in Orlando. And there were some people who brought COVID in, but nobody got it while they were there. 
Um, this season, they tried to take precautions, but there are there were a number of players who got pulled out of games because they got exposed in some way or another. So there, there's always you're you're always going to be trying to weigh um, how safe you are versus how practical it is to actually do it. Um, there are some practical aspects about how you plan your rehearsal that can influence how much air you get exposed to. Uh, as I say, if you do the risk calculators, the risk is substantially lower with a smaller number of people in the room. So a smaller group would be associated with a smaller risk. Can you get enough people in that you get the rehearsal that you need? That's going to be a big question. Um, if your rehearsal is shorter, uh, that's associated with a lower risk. Um, at the peak of the pandemic, the Colorado group was suggesting that rehearsals be no more than 30 minutes. And after 30 minutes, you need to run something that recirculates the air at least twice before having people come back. Um, uh, having fewer breaks, perhaps having some of it outside could potentially help. Um, reducing the amount of additional stuff that generates aerosols. Unfortunately, most of us are not just there to sing. I mean, we do, there are people that we haven't seen in a year and a half, we wanna catch up, but the problem is the chit chat, the taking the masks off to eat, all those things expose you to additional risk. So again, I think it's pretty clear cut. People shouldn't offer refreshments or eat with masks off as a group while indoors. Outdoors might be okay, but not indoors. Um, there is also the possibility of having testing be a precondition with a negative test being a precondition of being able to show up. You can get these rapid tests that'll get you results relatively quickly. They're not that expensive. They don't need, a, they don't need a, an order, but if you've got a course of 100 people, that can add up to some pretty serious money with weekly or twice weekly rehearsals. Um, workplaces are sometimes requiring some manner of attestation that you are not sick, you have not been sick, and you've not been exposed to anybody who's sick, um, and your ID unlocks the door only if you answer the correct way to all those questions. That's probably, again, more than most groups can do, but strategies like that have certainly been implemented, including at my own workplace. Um, there is also the question about what to do with sick singers. And I mean, I think if there's any one big thing that has come out of COVID-19, it's that people who are sick should not tough it out, should not try to show up, should not just be there to be part of the group because they have the potential risk of spreading other things and not just COVID-19, influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, and all the other cold things and taking down other members of the group with them. So at least it's my thought that anybody who feels like they're sick should not be at rehearsal. But that means that your group will have to come up with some sort of policy for what to do for those people who cannot make it. Is it simply going to be notes about what you missed at rehearsal? Um, you know, with the uh, video technology that's available, you could potentially live stream or even record the rehearsals. Though I do also grasp that if all the rehearsals are recorded, there could be a temptation for busy people to simply not show up and be like, oh, I'll just watch the recording and not really pay attention. We had a couple questions come in, James. Yep. Um, one is on distancing, uh, mm -hmm. whether choirs should continue to distance during rehearsals. Yep. Is that coming up? That's the next slide. Perfect. Uh, what's, Let's go on was... and to the other folks who asked some questions, just hang tight and we'll get to those in a moment. So these are two interesting studies. I mean, there, there have been multiple studies about strategies to help musicians reduce risk. Um, on the left is a study that compared several different strategies to try to help reduce the risk of transmission. Um, they compared spacing of people. They compared strategic placement of HEPA filters. Um, they, they, they compared having everybody be masked for the gathering. Um, and unsurprisingly, the best outcome happens when everybody is spaced. Uh, the, the spacing, if there's a lot of talking or singing, is probably more than six feet. It's probably more like nine feet um, with filters or air exchanges and fully masked. Now, the thing about this, I, I mean, I'll get more into that doesn't mean that that I'm telling you that that is what you have to do for every rehearsal. Um, but it's just the risk is lower if you take all the precautions, the risk is higher if you take fewer of the precautions. Um, on the right is an interesting thing that was done by the Utah Symphony. Um, 
again, the, the Colorado group has actually gotten some, some fascinating data about which instruments convey how much risk. The answers are not always what you think. Most of us thought that flutes would be a horror show. It turns out flute shedding rates are actually not that high. Um, winds are certainly higher than string instruments. Brass are the highest. So uh, what they did is they did air dynamic studies in uh, the Abravanel Hall in, in Salt Lake City and came up with a design, a, a reseating of the orchestra in which uh, some of the members of the orchestra are in the middle and some of the members are off on the sides. The brass were sort of nearest to the big ventilation devices and that did actually have a meaningful and measurable effect. So it isn't just how spaced you are, it's also where you are in the room which unfortunately is going to be dependent on the room because the vents are in different places, the windows are in different places. Sometimes it'll be practical to have the windows open, sometimes it won't. Um, unfortunately, the traditional rehearsal space of cramped, unventilated, hot, humid room is probably not the ideal place to have a rehearsal. James, one other question came in about rehearsal venues, all other things being equal, um, is there less risk in a larger room um, than in a smaller room? So we would think that a larger room and a room with a higher ceiling probably has a lower risk because as you spew out your cloud, it has more places to go in a bigger room in a higher ceiling than in a more cramped space. Great. Um, having said that, the air exchange is much more important than the size of the room. But, okay. but yes, a bigger space is going to probably be a lower risk type of um, situation. So Martha, Jeremy, and Sarah, thank you for your questions. Hopefully we answered those questions about distancing masks and room size. Um, Peter, I think your question might be one that is best for the full panel. So we might hold off on that and have James continue with his slides. So thank you for your patience, Peter. Masks. Uh, so the link here is is the CDC's brief about masks. Um, I will say the data about masks is at best shaky because again, no one's going to do a randomized trial of exposing people deliberately to COVID-19. All this has to be indirect assessment. Um, it's also the case that because there are all kinds of ways to do things ideally and not do things ideally. Um, there is no guarantee about one specific kind of mask or another. Um, the data would generally tend to suggest that even a homemade cloth mask could reduce the transmission by as much as 90%, but it depends on how you design it. Um, the, the, the sort of um, uh, the surgical procedure masks uh, reduce the risks substantially and are required in healthcare facilities. N95 masks, which filter out 95% of all the particles that you breathe in or out are still safer. However, the key with this is when you work with an N95 at work, you actually have to be fitted with it, which is to say you stick the mask on, they stick a hood over you and they squirt droplets in. And if you smell the droplets, then the mask does not fit. So you cannot have substantial leakage around where the mask is on your face, which is a challenge if you're singing because even the best fitting mask is going to leak something if you are singing the Mozart Requiem at triple forte. Um, if, you, if you're wearing your mask and your eyeglasses fog up, your mask is not fitting properly. You, you actually need to, to, to do a tighter fit because that means some air is escaping. Um, so, and if you wear the mask over your nose, uh, that accomplishes approximately nothing in terms of protection. Um, uh, face shields are useful to protect against droplets. They unfortunately offer minimal to no protection against aerosols. Um, there was also some stuff that suggested exposure to any mucosal surface, which potentially includes the eyes, might be a risk. Um, I, I would say if you're intubating a COVID-19 patient in the intensive care unit, this is an important consideration. I'm not so sure it's such a big deal in a choir rehearsal. Um, there's some stuff that suggests that eyeglasses help to lower the risk, that goggles are better, but I'm not sure that that's something to get so caught up on. 
Um, the interesting thing that has come from the Colorado study is that use of bell masks, this is the diagram down here on the bottom right, can substantially reduce the, the, the rate at which woodwind and brass instruments emit aerosols. Um, and this uh, on the left shows the difference between aerosol uh, rates with a woodwind instrument, with a uh, brass instrument, and with a singer, and again, comparing with a mask versus without a mask, you can see that there's a substantial reduction. The downside to singing with the mask on is that it's naturally going to alter how much sound you can make, how easy you are to hear. Um, you would have to be concerned that, that if you are distanced and masked, it's gonna make it even harder for the ensemble to hear each other. And that in particular, untrained voices, I think, might be tempted to push harder, which is not good for their voices, defeat some of the purpose of being masked. So th there are considerations in terms of uh, what to do. And it's hard enough to be heard over an orchestra as it is. If you're going to try to sing a full concert over an orchestra, it's going to be really, really hard to try to do that with a mask on. James, we had a question um, you went through really helpfully the effectiveness and the qualities of the different kinds of masks. Into mm -hmm. what category would you put singers' masks? The ones that. Yep. Have so I'm, the, the singers' masks are of a variety of different constructions. Um, some of them are simply pieces of cloth where, if they provide very good coverage across the face, down across the chest, and they don't allow a lot of stuff to escape out the protection rates are actually probably pretty good. Um, there are other masks that go uh, further. Uh, th there is a mask that I use, uh, which I actually I use for everyday use in addition for singing, which again provides fairly good coverage and they actually sell them in six different sizes, including three kids sizes. Um, it's a cloth exterior, but then there's actually a procedure mask insert on the inside. So you actually get, uh, and, and sorry, I should back up. The, the procedure masks actually have sort of an ionization in the lining that actually helps to capture some of those extra droplets and such, which is why a surgical mask actually provides more, more protection than just a cloth mask. So if you have a, a surgical mask type insert inside of a cloth mask, you might even be able to do still better than with just one or the other of them. Um, because the other thing that's nice about a cloth mask is it's machine washable with a removable insert. You can just keep putting the insert in and out and clean the thing because you probably don't want to have your nasty snot on the same mask over and over and over again. So, so it depends on the fit. It depends on the quality of the leakage. Um, it depends on the weave. It depends on what kind of fibers. Um, there are some things, uh, the, the Colorado stuff actually has some data comparing different types of masks. Uh, they, they have done stuff uh, looking at and comparing that stuff. Um, and they're offering updated webinars periodically about uh, where they stand at this point. And, and this link here is probably the go-to link in terms of trying to get to what's the latest and the greatest in terms of what they figured out. Uh, the, they, they issue updates roughly quarterly. Great, thank you. So what do we do with this? Um, there's this interesting uh, op-ed that was written by a public health person named Ashish Jha on the Boston Globe about two weeks ago. Um, where he wrote about the whole question of do we put masks back on now the delta's out and the analogy he made because on the one hand vaccines are fantastic they offer protection rates of somewhere between 90 and 95 percent in terms of keeping people out of hospitals and killing people um dr jaw's analogy is to a hockey team that has an outstanding goalie if you have an outstanding goalie who turns away 95% of the shots on goal, that does not mean that you stop playing defense. Uh, but what level of defense you do, how many defenders you have, how many of the mid, the mid players you put on defense is a question of how much pressure there is on the system. So I'm giving you the tools to, to look at what's the risk and what's the mitigation. And you do more mitigation if the risk is higher. Uh, if the risk is super, super high, then you do the ultimate mitigation, which is cancel the whole smash and stop everything. Um, if, the, if the rates are lower, then you can probably relax some of these things and not be so concerned about 
whether or not you've got masks, whether or not you're distanced and things like that. If it's only two or three people rehearsing, you're not nearly as worried as when it's a choir of 100. Um, so you, you have to take all those factors into account when you're making your decision about what to do with your specific group. Uh, every decision you make has benefits in terms of protection. It has costs in terms of inconvenience, in terms of impracticality. And you do have to make a decision about where your balance is in terms of what risk you're willing to take versus how much you're willing to go through, knowing that there are extremes that are probably unreasonable. Um, I, I had to travel in April. I saw people on airlines who are wearing top to bottom zip down Tyvek suits. I think that's probably a little bit too much. Um, the, the whole thing about cleansing surfaces, I mean, yeah, again, you don't want people's snot rags wiped all over every surface, but on the other hand, cleaning things every five minutes does not add anything in terms of reducing transmission. Uh, you have to figure out how you're going to set the policies, how you're going to enforce them, what you're going to do, how, how you will handle people who are not in compliance with the things that you've asked them to do. Um, people have asked reasonable questions for which there are not great answers about what to do if you are exposed to other people at home, such as children who, who at this point cannot be immunized, such as the elderly where if they get it or if they have other risk factors such as diabetes or heart disease or emphysema, that their risk of a bad outcome is substantially higher. Uh, with the immunosuppressed, it's really confusing about do they even have a higher risk of getting COVID? Do they respond to the vaccines? We don't know. Uh, should people with religious or health contraindications to the vaccines be allowed into a rehearsal? You have to make that kind of a decision. Um, there are no good answers to that. You just, again, you have to weigh your benefits versus your costs. Um, the data remain in progress. We didn't even know this virus existed until December of 2019, and data is getting churned out at a regular rate, which means you need to look at the most recent updated information to try to figure out what you're going to do in terms of your decisions. The, the Georgia Tech tool does follow Johns Hopkins data, which gets updated weekly. Uh, the MWRA thing is reasonably up to date, though I've been watching the thing to make sure that it is in fact getting updated regularly. Um, the CDC's science briefs will be getting updated regularly as additional studies get published. They will be added to the briefs. I'm throwing in a little plug for a blog that I did not write, but it's published on the website of my employer. Um, the, the person from the PR department there has done a terrific job of summing up a whole batch of, of commonly asked questions around COVID, like what do masks do? What do vaccines do? How do you handle risks of immunization? Um, what do you do in terms of traveling? How do you handle restaurants? Things like that. Um, there are also two invaluable resources that are worth checking out. The National Association of Teachers of Singing have been doing regular webinars about singing and COVID. And this link here is a webinar that they just did about a week or two ago. And there's a whole batch of incredibly useful information and links to more resources there. And uh, there's another group called the Gala Choruses who posted a webinar and also uh, their website is also filled with useful resources with information. What we are hoping to achieve, sorry. Um, as you uh, switch slides and think about your chimes, I did just wanna um, address, there were a couple questions in the chat asking for specifics about masks. James did mention he's not gonna make specific recommendations and BSR feels most comfortable not doing that. Either I would encourage you to just think about what James mentioned, things like fit and weave there um, and try different masks and make your own decisions. So if folks have things that they want, if they have ones that they love that they wanna put in the chat to share with other folks, that's fine, but we're gonna stay away from making those specific recommendations. Thanks, back to you, James. Yeah, I, I have one I like, but I don't wanna, my wind up making it look like I'm a salesman for that particular brand. Um, this, of course, is what we are hoping for as the endpoint. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Um, thank you for the your thoughtfulness in addressing questions. Um, and thank you for the obvious care that you have for our singing community. Um, it's, this is really, really lovely. 
Um, so I did just want to mention before we go on, um, Peter did ask a question about strategies for dealing with medical or religion-based exceptions to vaccination. So James, if you want to add anything about that, um, he writes, it's hard for me to imagine how non-vaccinated people could participate. Please uh, feel free to add anything or we can have um, perhaps some of our other panelists are going to add um, question, address this in their response. I mean, I think I'd have to say, you know, the, the problem again is that you're worried about the health of a group, not just the health of uh, the health of one. Skagit Valley showed us that it only takes one sick person to potentially take an entire choir down. Um, so personally, I would tend to be very, very conservative about who I let into the rehearsal room. Um, it's disappointing, but, you know, if someone is immunosuppressed, maybe they should sit out this year. Um, if they are elderly and super worried about their health, maybe this is not the time to, maybe this is not the time to try to do it. Great. Thank you. Um, I see Irvin has his hand up. Irvin, I see that you wrote a lengthy comment in the chat. Do you have a question as well? Well, my question, uh, uh, first to thank you, Jim, for your presentation. Um, the current CDC guidelines, as you, as you well know, and others may also know, is that um, individuals who are fully vaccinated um, two weeks after their final dose, as you mentioned, Jim, uh, may do any and all activities they did before the pandemic uh, without masks and without social distancing. Uh, that's the current official CDC recommendation. Um, if every member of the of a chorus uh, proves to the administration of that group uh, shows them their card, um, then they should be able to come into the rehearsal room. Absent that, for whatever reason, they're not vaccinated, whether it's religious or medical, they should not be allowed into the rehearsal room, much less to a, a performance. And again, the only reason per the CDC and the various studies that I'm sure you've read, Jim, that a, the only medical reason for not getting a vaccine uh, is that if you, if you are allergic to some component of the of the vaccine, uh, people who have uh, immunocompromised uh, situations, if anything, need the vaccine more than the rest of us. Um, although, of course, as many of you know, uh, they they do not mount as vigorous a response to the the vaccine. So, as Jim, you said a minute ago, it may be prudent for them to sit out this this season. Um, prudent for them as individuals and prudent for the for the chorus also. Uh, nobody wants to be, you know, discriminating against anyone for any reason, but there are public health considerations, which again, you mentioned, Jim, that uh, super, supersede uh, those things. And in terms of the audience, um, there already are some venues which are requiring proof of vaccination before you can uh, get a ticket and show up to the venue. Uh, a little more cumbersome, a little more work for people like Peter, um, but I think well worth it. What do you think, Jim? Um, so good, thoughtful questions. Um, this, the CDC's recommendation about do whatever you want with no masks is problematic. Um, there are certainly multiple people in the public health community who thought that perhaps that advice came out a little bit prematurely. Um, there's a certain ex thing that you can understand what motivated it. Uh, I think the hope was to try to encourage people to accept the vaccine, um, in, in particular people who would sort of resist the idea of getting the vaccine, although it appears that strategy isn't working. And the problem is that if you then get something like a Delta outbreak, uh, and then you say you got to put masks back on, it frankly, further compromises the credibility of the group because it's just, I put masks on, I don't put masks on, what do I do? And no one's having that nuanced conversation of weighing benefit versus risk. Um, there is also actually a relatively recent report that is rather chilling of a wedding that happened outside of Houston. Uh, it actually occurred in an outdoor tent. There were 92 people who were present uh, one couple wound up developing COVID-19. 
uh, about six or eight people, all of whom were immunized. It was required that everybody showing up to this wedding be immunized. Six of them got sick and one person died. And again, so it's not likely that this is going to happen, but again, it's the uh, trying to balance keeping people safe versus allowing people to do what they want, what they want and love to do. It's, well, and it's challenging you. and there's not a great answer. Thank you so much for addressing some of those topics. Um, I do want to move into uh, the um, kind of our, the second part of our program, which is hearing how folks are planning their own seasons. So um, we're just gonna go in alphabetical order through our wonderful panelists. So I'm gonna invite Meyer Chambers from Boston College and elsewhere to introduce himself and share a little of what he has planned. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Margaret, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. And I, I commend the Boston Singer Resource for um, actually doing this and convening it. Uh, James, that, that presentation was incredible and incredibly informative. And I, I am not an expert by any means or stretch of the imagination. But as I listened to James' presentation, if I bring anything to this table, it is that I, I am sort of a management end user, if you will, of the information that he put forth because I work with several different populations. Um, and in hearing my story a little bit, perhaps you'll understand what I mean and you'll hear some of the things that James talked about and I'll try to be as brief as I can because I know we have, we'd like to be finished by 8 p.m. So I am uh, entering my 35th year at St. Sebastian School. Um, I do the church music. I'm primarily a church musician these days. I am entering my 34th year at St. John, St. well, St. Catherine Drexel Parish and, and Grove Hall, which was formerly St. John St. Hugh's Church. I am coming into my 30th year as director of the Black Catholic Choir of the Archdiocese of Boston. And I am going into my 19th year as the campus minister for liturgical music at Boston College. And the variations between all of those different populations, I'll start with the young men. Um, St. Sebastian's, I have about maybe 10 singers, um, uh, uh, let's start, say that again, about 10 re reluctant adolescent males who come to offer the, <laughs> their service in song um, in a number of instrumental. Um, in this past year, for example, I was not able to use any of the wind instrumentalists. I used only the stringed instruments and percussion and any electronic instruments that we have. At um, Boston College, uh, it's primarily a young adult population, um, ages um, 17, 18 to 22. Um, at the, uh, the parish, St. Catherine Drexel, it's a range of mostly middle-aged folks in their 50s through their 60s, 70s some. And in the Black Catholic Choir, um, we range from uh, performers and participants who are in their 40s all the way through 94. And we have a great time together. Um, I, as a matter of fact, a lot of the things that Jim talked about, I discussed with the Black Catholic Choir last night. We had a Zoom call last night about, A, answering the question, do we want to open in the fall? because um, unlike some of the other places where I work, governance is an issue. And I'll talk a little bit about that with the other three places, but with the Black Catholic Choir, it's, it's an elective thing. So there have to be some common agreements amongst the members. Uh, like I said, do you want to come back? Overwhelmingly, people want to come back. Will you come back is the next question. And there was some wavering there. Some people are uncomfortable. Some people know that there are people in the choir that have not been vaccinated and for whatever personal reasons they have, some choose not to be vaccinated. But I'm glad to hear that vaccination can be mandated um, and asking for the vaccination card can be something that's put forward as long as we don't keep a, a copy of it. I really appreciate knowing that. 
because that was a, a bit of a, a, a bone of contention last night. Um, and also, you know, thinking about the group as a whole and people's health and keeping people safe and having medical personnel. Um, I don't have any medical doctors, but I do have nurses in, in all of my choirs, except for the teenagers, uh, nursing students at the college, of course. And uh, they, they give me good feedback as to how we should be progressing. As far as for the, the, the high school and the university, there are some governance issues, as I mentioned. I have the school administration um, and uh, St. Sebastian is in, is in Needham. So you have the town weighing in on it. Of course, you have the CDC and the national, but because we're Catholic, we also have the Archdiocese of Boston, which I think has the, the most direct um, influence on the way I operate and the way the students operate. At Boston College, because we have one foot in Newton and one foot in Boston, we're sort of governed by those two things. And then there's the, the, the health administration at the university. So you have a lot of things that, that are forming my thinking and forming our practice. Uh, the discussion that you had about uh, the, the, the rehearsal space, as I thought about it, Margaret, when we, where we rehearse normally on Wednesdays, those are lower ceilings. But where Mark, the chapel Margaret has been in for the past year has very high cathedral type ceilings. So some decisions need to be made there. And uh, again, this is influencing the way we're going forward. We have begun the discussions with the students as to how they want to come back, how they, um, how they want to proceed. And I've told them what some of the parameters are going to be. It's still in formation. We will keep distance. We will um, uh, keep everyone facing the same way in the same direction. That's something that came from the Archdiocese of Boston as to how choirs should, uh, should behave in church. And uh, initially with the Black choir, Catholic Choir especially, during our rehearsals, we agreed that we would wear masks, at least initially during those rehearsals. We do have uh, a request for an engagement in um, late September for that group. I haven't decided, nor has the group decided whether they wanna accept that engagement, but interestingly, it would be an outdoor activity. Um, uh, early in September, around the 9th, the university um, has a big opening mass um, and I usually have 35, 40 singers there. They're on risers. We may have to rethink that, that, that process this year. Um, there's usually, a, uh, I believe, a brass uh, uh, component that's there and other instruments as well, primarily strings, but some wind instruments might participate. Um, so, a lot of things are still being calculated on our part, but we are planning to open up at that level with a full swing. The high school may be a little bit different um, because for this past year, we did not use any singers, as I said. Well, I used one singer. I, I would use a cantor from time to time, a, a student cantor, but I did most of the singing myself. And it was, we, we had the... Um, the good fortune to be in a, a very open, uh, well, it was a wrestling room that was converted into a, a gathering space. It's a very large room, but the church setting, if we're allowed to go back into that church, which is attached to the school, it's gonna be the more traditional um, type church setting, which would have the students very close to each other. So, and, and there's not been a specific mandate from the high school yet as to whether or not everyone needs to be vaccinated. Whereas the university has required that everyone who plans to come back to Boston College this fall must be vaccinated, both students and, um, and the staff. Now, there are a lot of people that are applying, I shouldn't say that because I read the article that says something else. There are people who are applying for exemptions um, some of them on religious grounds uh, and some on other grounds. But I, you know, I don't, I don't have any input into that, but I can tell you that it's not going well for the people that are applying because especially if they're Roman Catholic and they want to apply for <laughs> a religious exemption, when your Pope stands up and gets vaccinated, that doesn't go over too well with the, the powers that be that would grant those sorts of um, exemptions. 
So that's kind of where we are right now. I probably could tell you some other minor details about what we're doing, but the hope, the hope, and there's a hunger as well um, that we can get back into full swing. Thank you so much, Meyer. Yes. Um, we are gonna go on to our next panelist, but please feel free to chime in if um, questions come up, I will read them. And if you, want, if you want to chime in on that, please feel free to speak up again. So thank you again to Meyer Chambers. Lisa, you're up. Hey, thank you. And thanks everybody uh, for being here. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, there's some, uh, yeah, my two hats are, I'm a college director, so I'm at Wellesley College. And I also have a group called Metropolitan group, uh, Corral, which rehearses mostly in the Brookline area and performs in Boston and Greater Boston. So um, like my uh, friend Meyer, uh, you know, the college is going to dictate what we're going to be able to do as far as um, how, how we're able to meet, how we're able to rehearse, if we will be allowed to have um, live performances, et cetera. Um, you know, I think we are expecting to meet in person again. I think it's super important. I think for a lot of schools, colleges, if we go another year without the chance to be together, um, it'll be kind of a death knell for a lot of programs. So we managed to meet, um, you know, and produce content and et cetera this last year, but people really want to be together. And I honestly think for both of my groups that the rehearsal is actually way more important than the concert right now. People want to sing together. They want to be together. So my priority is that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to that a little bit. Um, with, with Wellesley, I'll just briefly say I'm having basically uh, plans, plan A, plan B, plan C, you know, if, if we're, if we're able to do this, then that, etc. So, um, that's how I'm approaching it. Um, I'm also going to, um, you know, a lot of those safety precautions are, are handled for me. You know, the, the college requires vaccination, um, safety checks, testing. So, um, however, I am going to have in the budget, uh, you know, to be able to film our concerts and to even produce a concert video, you know, above and beyond just a live stream, just to make sure um, that we're able to reach our audiences and that our students and singers can um, have their families, you know, be able to see what they're doing. That's really important, family and friends. Um, I've... Uh, I have a hard time rehearsing in a mask, um, the very little that I've done. Um, so hoping to have a lavalier mic, you know, um, a sound system to, so that as a conductor, that you're just not, you know, try, really trying too hard to, to speak to the group. Cause you know, especially with the distance, you know, there's this visual thing where people are far apart and the masks. So it's really hard to communicate. I, if you're able to, I'd, I'd advise trying to get even a simple um, amplification system and if possible, something where your singers can, can use a mic to, to ask questions. Um, if you're planning on using masks, um, which we are. Um, and so anyway, just a few contingency plans, you know, for I would just have a lot of flexibility, understand that really the process is the most important thing um, than perhaps, you know, big splashy performance. We're coming back together and I think we have to be flexible and I think we have to um, know that this is a moving target and be ready for that. Um, for Metropolitan Corral, very different, of course. Um, we, since we are rehearsed in Brookline, we'll obviously be following the, the guidance from, from our local authorities. Um, I should say that Wellesley's president is a physician, so we're very lucky to have that leadership. And the president of, of our Corral is actually a, a, a safety officer inspector and runs a COVID testing lab. So that's kind of good luck for us. but. So we've got we've got a lot of knowledgeable people that we're we're hoping to tap and you know get best in, best practice from. Um, we are planning to meet. We are planning to require vaccinations for all of our singers. If someone does not want to get vaccinated for their for whatever reason, religious, etc., um, you know that's their choice, and and we we have the right to say that you know they they should 
stay home until you know we can make further judgment. But uh, we are planning to hopefully film our rehearsals and offer that or live stream them um, so that people can still feel part of the group and attend. Um, and especially if they're they're not well, we obviously tell them to stay home um, and and tune in from there. And I think we've learned that that Zoom and all these other platforms have allowed for some of of that distanced learning and participation. And I know, for especially for older individuals and people who are really isolated, that's hugely important to feel included and, and part of the the situation. Um, you know, we've been having some trouble with venue booking <laughs> and you knowing what's going on. Like I said, I think it's, you know, it's going to be a lot about, you know, what's on offer. We are changing our rehearsal space to a, a larger uh, uh, space with more ventilation, more accessible. Um, we are backloading our season. Um, we have some engagements um, in, in December. We will start rehearsing in the fall, but um, we, we will rehearse music uh, for the December engagements, um, which are booked through Boss and Pops. We do some touring with them for the holidays, and they're actually planning concerts this year. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, but we're going to start rehearsing also for our March concert, which we're hoping will happen. And um, I have uh, I've programmed double choir music. So I can rehearse one choir at a time. So we're usually a hundred people. We'll rehearse choir one, you know, for this song and choir two for this song and then put them together at some point. Um, I hope that's a clever strategy. <laughs> I don't know, but um, that will be, you know, for a March concert and we'll have plenty of time to prepare, I hope. And just give ourselves a really good running start, you know, enough time, enough space. If things have to shift, We've already, we're talking to our videographer, um, you know, we're planning to be able to do the concert, you know, film the concert if we can't produce it, you know, in person. So um, again, the sound system, um, having, you know, a way to communicate to the choir if they're wearing masks and you're wearing masks, which, you know, we are planning to do. Um, just small things, member surveys. We send out a big member survey every year um, asking a lot of questions about people's comfort level, about even their, you know, their vaccine situation, their thoughts on it, um, and providing a lot of opportunity for questions and feedback and, and, you know, ongoing conversation that we will be very transparent with our, um, our requirements and still have room for conversations and, and listening. Um, so that's basically our our um, our plan. Um, we may have people sign waivers, you know, just to you know say that they are accepting the risk of, of participating in our group, um, and that they agree uh, to our policies, etc. So we have kind of a, a contract with our singers. You know, it, it holds us us accountable and, and them accountable. Um, we are going to require proof of vaccination. Yes, we think that's if, if we're going to go ahead and ask people to be vaccinated, I think I think it's fair enough to just to say, great, show us the card, you know, um, there's a lot of goodwill and trust in our group. Um, and we've really built, I think, a strong community. And, and um, I think if people have a problem with it, you know, we'll just have to deal with it. Um, and and have those tough conversations but the health of of everybody is is truly you know the most important thing so that's my spiel and i'm happy to answer any questions thank you very much lisa um yes peter is pointing out in the chat that smaller groups reduce exposure for singers but the choir director and accompanist have full exposure so um i i found a lot of what what you mentioned very helpful from the thinking to get singers thinking about the conductor's perspective and some of their needs. So thank you for that. And bringing the love from Central Mass, we have Mark, who is going to share what's going on with him. Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I have a th three uh, fields of reference. Uh, I am the Cantor Director of Music at Trinity Lutheran Church in Worcester, Massachusetts where I lead a 25 voice volunteer choir. Uh, we actually rehearsed all year uh, on Thursday evenings in our cars doing uh, uh, singing and 
microphones and bringing that all into a mixer and then hearing their voices on the car radio. So we actually did rehearse all year and a half. Um, and uh, that was very good for our group. In, in April of this year, we did get back into a uh, weeknight rehearsal. Uh, by April 1, the entire uh, choir was vaccinated. So we resumed Thursday night rehearsals and uh, we were sitting uh, distanced in a very large, well-ventilated room. Everyone was masked. It turned out that the day that the CDC announced that rehearsals could be uh, with uh, fully vaccinated people could happen without masks, that, that, that announcement came from the CDC on a Thursday and all of the members of the choir showed up for the rehearsal that night and they asked, they knew about the CDC uh, lifting of the mask rule, and they all said, we would like to rehearse without a mask. I made sure everybody was okay with that. And they all took their masks off and we rehearsed them through the end of the season in a very large ventilated room, the 25 people without masks. Um, our congregation is worshiping on Sunday mornings and we still are wearing masks in worship. Our congregation decided to keep wearing masks even though the mask uh, mandate was lifted uh, because we have still have children in our assembly and we decided that we would want to protect them. So on Sunday mornings, Trinity Choir is singing with masks on. Uh, uh, during the year, there were six singers of the 25 sang at Sunday services spread out across the organ gallery. And by the end of the year in May, we had uh, all of them in the organ gallery again spread out. We have a very large gallery and a very high ceiling. So we're anticipating this fall being back. We will probably still be wearing masks as it will still not be possible for our children to be vaccinated. Uh, but we we'll probably will have rehearsals, uh, uh, shorter rehearsals, Thursday evenings with the church choir. Uh, I am associate conductor of Worcester Chorus, and Worcester Chorus is resuming in-person rehearsals this September. Uh, the, we just decided three weeks ago that the Worcester Chorus would, all of them would need to have proof of vaccination to sing with the chorus and would need to bring a bring their vaccination card to the first rehearsal in September. That would mean then we would rehearse without masks in a, also a very large ventilated room. Um, the interestingly enough, uh, Music Worcester, which is our parent organization, is has not produced a flyer with the season coming up. They are going to advertise the season as we go. We were rehearsing Brahms Requiem when we went into the pandemic and the plan is, is if we can do uh, Brahms Requiem this fall, we will do it. Uh, and then if not, then we hope that we can present Messiah, our annual Messiah uh, in December. Uh, one of the reasons that Worcester Chorus determined that they would uh, require of all singers uh, a vac proof of vaccination is that the the Central Mass, or I guess it's Worcester County Musicians Union is requiring that of all of the musicians who are playing the orchestral gigs that we do. And we learned that it would be a compromise then if we, if the chorus wouldn't guarantee that we were all vaccinated to be performing with all of those orchestral musicians that were, that had proof of vaccination. So we made that decision based on that, um, uh, information. I sing with Concora, um, a professional vocal ensemble in Connecticut, and we just this last June uh, did a, a video recording of Bach motets, six motets. We did that with 24 voices. They were all vaccinated and showed proof of vaccination, and we sang those recording sessions and rehearsals without masks. Uh, uh, and that recording was just released two days ago. So in my, um, in my shops, uh, we are 
mostly singing with vaccinated people without masks in well-ventilated spaces uh, and uh, a few occasions where we we're performing with masks, but uh, not much. Thank you. A um, couple questions in the chat. I'm going to go a little out of order. Um, among our panelists, are any of your, do you know if any of your ensembles have added additional insurance liability coverage or if you're running into increased requirements from venues? Have you made any changes to your insurance coverage based on this situation? I'm seeing lots of shaking heads. So Aaron, that's a really, that's an interesting, um, really great question. And Every, we are all shaking our heads. So <laughs> that's as close to an answer as we're going to get. But um, it, it is worth, I mean, it is worth thinking about. Yeah. Um, Grace is asking about audience polling. Um, I know there's been some pretty significant audience polling that was done by, I'll have to think of what the organization was and send the results out. Um, it unfortunately was not classical specific. It had to do with a lot of different types of arts and culture. Um, and it, it showed that people were eager to come back. Have any of our panelists had audience um, audience surveys yet? Or, or congregant surveys? Mark, please. So this is perhaps a little bit anecdotal, but uh, Worcester Chamber Music Society just did a week of um, a chamber fest and they'd had three concerts. Capacity in the room was 100. And I, this was not a result of a survey or anything, but they sold out all three concerts. People came back. That anecdotal evidence says to me, and they would probably not have sold out in the middle of the summer and seasons before. So I think what that showed me is that there's a hunger for people wanting to get back in. And if they discern that it's going to be safe, or if they discern the risk is minimal, they will they will come out because there's a there's a hunger for it. So I I saw that as a very encouraging sign. We all wore masks. Everybody wore masks in those concerts, but the, the and the people didn't sit. We didn't line up the chairs the way we normally do. We had them set up in groups of threes and twos at once. So there was some distancing. So I think that was enough for people to welcome them back into the hall. So I'm feeling like, and the, the other thing I will say with regard to church is that our attendance since Easter has grown each week exponentially. We've had more people come back to Sunday uh, in-person worship uh, and it has not leveled off. It has continued to grow each week in my congregation. Thank you. And just to add an anecdote to Grace's question, you know, we had our Composers Lab concert for Boston Singers Resource that was a live concert and we had a uh, about the number that we would expect in any other time of folks. We were in a big space, windows open, spread out, um, and the vaccinated folks were, were really eager to be there and be part of some live music. Jack Ward mentioned in the chat the Audience Outlook Monitor, which is what I was trying to remember. So thank you so much, Jack, for putting that in the chat. I'll try to dig up a link to that and share it with the um, the follow-up that I'll send out after the fact. And I do wanna go back to Sarah's question about congregational singing. Mark mentioned that a little bit. Um, perhaps Meyer, you have more to add on that. Sure. I know um, Meyer, as Meyer alluded to, he and I work together in um, one, of, one of his many contexts and we are sort of at the we follow lots of other people's rules, which sometimes is nice to just be told what to do. So Meyer, do you wanna say anything about that? Absolutely. Um, as of May 23rd, the Archdiocese of Boston uh, lifted uh, the restriction on congregational singing, but it is up to the pastor's discretion um, as to how that's going to be implemented or whether or not it's going to be implemented because still in some of the churches in the archdiocese, people are still having mass outdoors and uh, they're sitting in their cars or whatever. Um, 
in my own congregation, uh, singing um, has been through a mask for the congregation. We've required that um, people coming to mass. We had an RSVP system that we just rescinded two weeks ago. Uh, so people could not just come in. They, their temperatures were taken, uh, hand sanitizing the whole nine yards, purifying the church in between masses, that kind of thing. But as far as for uh, singing of the congregation, um, it, it was it, it's done by mask right now. And we still have a portion of the church cordoned off uh, in, uh, for social distancing. Um, the people that are sitting in the center of the church are asked to social distance themselves. But for those that are either unvaccinated or uncomfortable, they are sitting on the side aisles, if that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mark, you looked like maybe you wanted to add another thought on that earlier. So with regard to congregational singing, in my congregation, the choir was singing on their behalf all spring. The congregation was not singing. The congregation now this summer is masked and we have each Sunday added a new singing element back in. Right. So now by the end of summer, we'll be back singing the full service and several hymns. But uh, right now it's probably four hymns and maybe one or two acclamations. That's about it. That sounds like a really thoughtful approach. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, James, you probably see in the chat a question from Peter, uh, if there has been any sort of singing cautionary tales in the post-vaccine era, um, any, any incidents involving singing that have caused any sort of spread? Like I know you mentioned one at a wedding earlier. Um, keeping in mind, we have about six minutes left. Anything, anything on that? I mean, I'm, I'm watching the literature. I mean, there, there are reports of outbreaks, there are reports of outbreaks among people who have been immunized. And while people are not necessarily getting sick, while they're not necessarily dying, they can still get things like long COVID, which is a whole world of trouble that you don't want to do just so that you can sing with other people. Yeah, it really does seem like it's probably a matter of time until, until we have um, a situation like that, which is why it's so good to be aware of risk. Um, like I said, we have five or six minutes left. Um, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat. I do ask you to be attentive to time and Jeopardy rules, please fr phrase it as a question. Um, lots of folks energetically sharing opinions in the chat. And while I, I see and honor your fervor, I do want to limit us to questions at this time. Irvin, go ahead. Well, my, my question is, could, could we come back to the science? And, you know, Rochelle Walensky, as we all probably know, was chief of infectious diseases at Mass General for a number of years, highly respected in her field, which, of course, includes viruses like the one we're talking about. Hi, Urban. Now has... Urban, I'm sorry to interrupt. I hear you kind of repeating the comment that you wrote. Do you have a specific question you want to ask in the limited time we have left? Yes. Why, why are we being more afraid than the Boston Symphony Orchestra or many theaters on Broadway? I, I would suggest that perhaps we're not afraid. Perhaps we are striving to be aware and um, thoughtful and present information. Um, we do have a couple of other questions. So, um, James, since you addressed a lot of the science, do you have a one or two minute response on Irvin's question? Thank you, Irvin. I mean, I think it, it's all a question of risk. It, it's all a question of risk tolerance. And it comes down to, I don't want to be responsible for giving a blessing on something that results in somebody's death. N not if I don't have to be. And again, from the manager perspective, we can't mandate that people come back to sing. Uh, it's, an in, it's an invitatory thing. And a lot of people are just plain nervous about it. Um, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation that's been spread out there. And even though people have good intentions, they only have one life. And they've watched enough people die from the COVID situation that they don't wanna put themselves in that position as much as they dearly love being with other people. And I speak, I'm speaking more about the, the elderly population that many of us deal with. So enough said. Lisa? 
And I might just briefly respond that uh, organizations like the Boston Symphony and Broadway are, are, are huge budget organizations. They are, they are driven, to, you know, by a, an economic need as much as anything else to, to continue their, uh, their work and their art. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to compare that to, you know, a community choir that maybe doesn't have the resources or the ability to, to adhere to all of the safety precautions. Thank you. Um, we are coming so close to the end of our time. We had um, a, a couple of questions come in that were asking about folks' individual uh, situations, about the size of the um, the size of the group, and whether folks should use masks with larger groups. Um, I'm I'm going to suggest that probably we can't make that decision for you, um, and. To really, I'm going to send out all of these links and tools, and you can think about um, those there. I wish I wish we had clear answers, but we don't. Mm -hmm. um, David shares a great comment. Seems important for the audience to be clearly told what the situation is for an event they might attend, so that they can make their own risk assessment. Um, mandated vaccinations for performers is key for that. I, I will say that has been BSR's approach in planning future programming is just being clear about what the um, what the situation is and what our expectations are and then the ways that we're going to try to alleviate the risk for our participants and our um, our audience members. Um, so thank you. Thank you to the folks for writing kind comments in the chat. It's always it's lovely to gather folks together and to start thinking about how we can deal with our situation in a way that allows us to continue doing what we love with just about um, two minutes left. If there's any last thoughts that anyone from our panel would like to share, I'd love to invite that and otherwise um, we will say good night. Someone asked about a Zoom rehearsal. The answer is yes, we did them this past year. Um, it was harder because the, the, the people that were singing on the other end had to have themselves muted. So I really couldn't hear what they were singing. Right. Uh, our colleague at Boston College, John Finney, had a unique way of doing that um, in that people recorded stuff and sent it back to him. So those are some tips. Uh, it wasn't ideal, but we were able to do, I thought what was a pretty good recording. Margaret can attest to that. <laughs> I agree. Um, thank you. Yes, Barry's asking if the PowerPoint presentation will be separate. Yes, it will. And that will give you, make all those links clickable for you. Lisa, you wanted to offer some final thoughts? Uh, no, just to say thank you to everybody. And, uh, you know, that it's just, it's so encouraging that everybody's got, you know, health and safety on their minds, but also knows how important it is that we're back together doing what we love and being with the people we love. And um, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody does in this creative time. Thank you so much. Mark? You said it all. Thank you. All so I'm much. saying is uh, I, I'm very grateful to have been included on this panel and it was very instructive for me as well. Thank you. Thank you. We're grateful for you. And James, who did such extraordinary work preparing resources for us, do you want to land the plane? Um, I, I'm simply going to echo something that Lisa said that I should have said, which is stay flexible, mm -hmm. have a backup plan, be prepared to change the plan because if all hell breaks loose, you, you have to change what you're doing. Exactly. Well, thank you so much to James Liu, Meyer Chambers, Lisa Graham, and Mark Mummer. Thank you to the board and staff of BSR who were able to be here tonight. And of course, all of the um, attendees and participants, many from Boston, but many from afar. It was exciting to see um, lots of folks from elsewhere who decided to join us for this. Um, we are, BSR is in the middle of a capital campaign celebrating our 20th anniversary year. So if you love what we do, you know I have to put the link to donate in the chat. <laughs> Thank you to all of you. Who, um, this is partly because the board is here. I need them to know I'm doing my job. Um, Thank you to those of you who contributed your registration fees for this event. Um, all those things go a long way to help us continue the programming that we want to provide to folks as we are getting back on track. So 
the resources will be sent out probably tomorrow, thinking about how long it's going to take for this to upload to my computer and then to YouTube. Um, so you'll probably most likely hear from us in the morning. And we are so grateful to you all for being here. I hope that you have a musical rest of your summer and I can't wait to attend all of your concerts in the fall. Thank you. Good night.